सी आई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट्स ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज चैप्टर एट डिवोशनल पार्ट्स टू द डिवाइन फ्रॉम पेज नंबर वन हंड्रेड फोर टू पेज नंबर वन हंड्रेड ट्वेंटी वन लेट्स लिसन टू द चैप्टर एट devotional paths to the divine page 104 you may have seen people perform rituals of worship or singing bhajans kirtans or qawwalis or even repeating the name of god in silence and noticed that some of them are moved to tears such intense devotion or love of god is the legacy of various kinds of bhakti and sufi movements that have evolved since the 8th century the idea of a supreme god before large kingdoms emerged different groups of people worshiped their own gods and goddesses as people were brought together through the growth of towns trade and empires new ideas began to develop the idea that all living things pass through countless cycles of birth and rebirth performing good deeds and bad came to be widely accepted similarly the idea that all human beings are not equal even at birth gained ground during this period the belief that social privileges came from birth in a noble family or a high caste was the subject of many learned texts many people were uneasy with such ideas and turned to the teachings of the buddha or the jains according to which it was possible to overcome social differences and break the cycle of rebirth through personal effort others felt attracted to the idea of a supreme god who could deliver humans from such bondage if approached with devotion or bhakti this idea advocated in the bhagavad gita grew in popularity in the early centuries of the common era page 105 shiva vishnu and durga as supreme deities came to be worshiped through elaborate rituals at the same time gods and goddesses worshiped in different areas came to be identified with shiva vishnu or durga in the process local myths and legends became a part of the puranic stories and methods of worship recommended in the purans were introduced into the local cults eventually the puranas also laid down that it was possible for devotees to receive the grace of god regardless of their caste status the idea of bhakti became so popular that even buddhists and jains adopted these beliefs on the right hand top of this page a picture is shown this is figure 1 this is a page from a south indian manuscript of the bhagavad gita on the right hand side of this page a question is being asked written in a blue box you can observe this process of local myths and legends receiving wider acceptance even today can you find some examples around you a new kind of bhakti in south india nayanars and alvars the 7th to 9th century saw the emergence of new religious movements led by the nayanars saints devoted to shiva and alvars saints devoted to vishnu who came from all castes including those considered untouchable like the pulayar and the panars they were sharply critical of the buddhists and jains and preached ardent love of shiva or vishnu as the path to salvation they drew upon the ideals of love and heroism as found in the sangam literature The earliest example of Tamil literature composed during the early centuries of the common era and blended them with the values of bhakti the nayanars and alvars 
went from place to place composing exquisite poems in praise of the deities enshrined in the villages they visited and set them to music. Page 106 On the top of this page, some important information is shared regarding the Nainars and Alvars in a pink box. Nainars and Alvars There were 63 Nainars who belonged to different caste groups such as potters, untouchable workers, peasants, hunters, soldiers, Brahmans and chiefs. The best known among them were Appar, Sambandar, Sundarar and Manikkavasagar. There are two sets of compilation of their songs, Tevaram and Tiruvachakam. There were twelve Alvars who came from equally divergent backgrounds, the best known being Peri Alvar, his daughter Andal, Tondar Dippodi Alvar and Nammalvar. Their songs were compiled in the Divya Prabandham. On the left-hand top of this page, some important information is shared. Hagiography Writing of Saints' Lives Between the 10th and 12th centuries, the Chola and Pandya kings built elaborate temples around many of the shrines visited by saint poets, strengthening the links between the bhakti tradition and temple worship. This was also the time when their poems were compiled. Besides hagiographies or religious biographies of the Alvars and Nainars were also composed. Today, we use these texts as sources for writing histories of the bhakti tradition. On the left bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 2. This is a bronze image of Manikkavasagar, the devotee and the Lord. This is a composition of Manikkavasagar. Into my vile body of flesh, you came as though it were a temple of gold and soothed me wholly and saved me. O Lord of grace, O gem most pure, sorrow and birth and death and illusion, you took from me and set me free. O bliss, O light, I have taken refuge in you, and never can I be parted from you. How does the poet Describe his relationship with the deity. Page 107 Philosophy and Bhakti Shankar, one of the most influential philosophers of India, was born in Kerala in the 8th century. He was an advocate of Advait or the doctrine of the oneness of the individual soul and the supreme God which is the ultimate reality. He taught that Brahman, the only or ultimate reality, was formless and without any attributes. He considered the world around us to be an illusion or maya and preached renunciation of the world and adoption of the path of knowledge to understand the true nature of Brahman and attain salvation. Ramanuja, born in Tamil Nadu, in the 11th century was deeply influenced by the Alvars. According to him, the best means of attaining salvation was through intense devotion to Vishnu. Vishnu, in his grace, helps the devotee to attain the bliss of union with him. He propounded the doctrine of Vishishtata Dvait, or qualified oneness, in that the soul even when united with the Supreme God, remained distinct. Ramanuja's doctrine greatly inspired the new strand of bhakti which developed in North India subsequently. 
Basvanna's Veer Shaivism. We noted earlier the connection between the Tamil Bhakti movement and temple worship. This in turn led to a reaction that is best represented in the Veer Shaivya movement initiated by Basvanna and his companions like Allama Prabhu and Akka Mahadevi. This movement began in Karnataka in the mid-12th century. The Veer Shaivs argued strongly for the equality of all human beings and against Brahminical ideas about caste and the treatment of women. They were also against all forms of ritual and idol worship. Page 108 Veer Shaivya Vachans These are vachans or sayings attributed to Basavanna. The rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing shall fall, but the moving ever shall stay. What is the temple that Basavanna is offering to God? The Saints of Maharashtra From the 13th to the 17th centuries, Maharashtra saw a great number of saint poets whose songs in simple Marathi continue to inspire people. The most important among them were Dhyaneshwar or Gyaneshwar, Namdev, Eknath, and Tukaram as well, as women like Sakhubai and the family of Chokhamela, who belonged to the untouchable Mahar caste. This regional tradition of bhakti focused on the Vithal temple in Pandharpur, as well as on the notion of a personal god residing in the hearts of all people. These saint poets rejected all forms of ritualism outward display of piety and social differences based on birth. In fact, they even rejected the idea of renunciation and preferred to live with their families, earning their livelihood like any other person, while humbly serving fellow human beings in need. A new humanist idea emerged as they insisted that bhakti lay in sharing others' pain. As the famous Gujarati saint Narsi Mehta said, There are Vaishnavas who understand the pain of others. On the left-hand side of this page, an important information is shared. The Vaishnava poet saints of Maharashtra, such as Gyaneshwar, Namdev, Eknath and Tukaram were devotees of Lord Vithal. Devotion around Lord Vithal gave rise to the Varkari sect, which lay emphasis on an annual pilgrimage to Pandharpur. The cult of Vithal emerged as a powerful mode of devotion and was very popular amongst the people. Page 109 Questioning the Social Order This is an abhang a Marathi devotional hymn of Sant Tukaram. He who identifies with the battered and the beaten, mark him as a saint, for God is with him. He holds every forsaken man close to his heart. He treats a slave as his own son, says Tuka. I won't be tired to repeat again, such a man is God in person. Here is an abhang composed by Chokha Mela's son. You made us low caste. Why don't you face that fact, great Lord? Our whole life left over food to eat. You should be ashamed of this. You have eaten in our home. 
how can you deny it? Chokha's son, Karma Mela, asks, Why did you give me life? Discuss the ideas about the social order expressed in these compositions. Page 110 Nath Panthis, Siddh and Yogis A number of religious groups that emerged during this period criticized the ritual and other aspects of conventional religion and the social order using simple, logical arguments. Among them were the Nath Panthis, Siddhachars and Yogis. They advocated renunciation of the world. To them, the path of salvation lay in meditation on the formless, ultimate reality and the realization of oneness with Him. To achieve this, they advocated intense training of the mind and body through practices like yogasanas, breathing exercises and meditation. These groups became particularly popular among low castes. Their criticism of conventional religion created the ground for devotional religion to become a popular force in northern India. On the left-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 3. This is a fireside gathering of ascetics. Islam and Sufism The sons had much in common with the Sufis, so much so that it is believed that they adopted many ideas of each other. Sufis were Muslim mystics. They rejected outward religiosity and emphasized love and devotion to God and compassion towards all fellow human beings. Islam propagated strict monotheism or submission to one God. In the 8th and 9th centuries, religious scholars developed different aspects of holy law or shariat and theology of Islam. While the religion of Islam gradually became more complex, Sufis provided it with an additional dimension that favored a more personal devotion to God. The Sufis often rejected the elaborate rituals and codes of behavior demanded by Muslim religious scholars. They sought union with God, much as a lover seeks his beloved with a disregard for the world. Page 111 Like the saint poets, the Sufis too composed poems expressing their feelings and a rich literature in prose, including anecdotes and fables developed around them. Among the great Sufis of Central Asia were Ghazali, Rumi and Saadi. Like the Nath Panthis, Siddhas and Yogis, the Sufis too believed that the heart can be trained to look at the world in a different way. They developed elaborate methods of training using zikr or chanting of a name or sacred formula, contemplation, sama or singing, raks or dancing, discussion of parables, breath control, etc. under the guidance of a master or peer. Thus emerged the Silsilas, a spiritual genealogy of Sufi teachers, each following a slightly different method or tariqa of instruction and ritual practice. On this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 4. It shows mystics in ecstasy. On the right-hand bottom of this page, some important information regarding Sufis has been provided. In Kashmir, the Rishi order of Sufism flourished in the 15th and 16th centuries. This order was established by Sheikh Nuruddin Wali, also known as Nand Rishi, and had a deep impact on the life of the people in Kashmir. 
A number of shrines dedicated to Rishi saints can be found in many parts of Kashmir. Page number 112 A large number of Sufis from Central Asia settled in Hindustan from the 11th century onwards. This process was strengthened with the establishment of the Delhi Sultanate, Chapter 3, when several major Sufi centers developed all over the subcontinent. The Chishti Silsila was among the most influential orders. It had a long line of teachers like Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti of Ajmer, Qutubuddin Bakhtiyar Kaki of Delhi, Baba Farid of Punjab, Khwaja Nizamuddin Aulia of Delhi, and Banda Nawaz Gisudaraz of Gulbarga. The Sufi masters held their assemblies in their Khan Kahas or hospices. Devotees of all descriptions, including members of the royalty and nobility and ordinary people, flocked to these Khan Kahas. They discussed spiritual matters, sought the blessings of the saints in solving their worldly problems or simply attended the music and dance sessions. Often people attributed Sufi masters with miraculous powers that could relieve others of their illnesses and troubles. The tomb or dargaha of a Sufi saint became a place of pilgrimage to which thousands of people of all faiths thronged. On the top of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 5. It's a page from a manuscript of the Quran, Deccan, late 15th century. Hospice, house of rest for travellers, especially one kept by a religious order. On the left bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 6. It shows that devotees of all backgrounds visit Sufi shrines. Page 113 Finding the Lord Jalaluddin Rumi was a great 13th century Sufi poet from Iran who wrote in Persian. Here is an excerpt from his work. He was not on the cross of the Christians. I went to the Hindu temples. In none of them was there any sign. He was not on the heights or in the lowlands. I went to the Kaaba of Mecca. He was not there. I asked about him from Evicenna, the philosopher. He was beyond the range of Evicenna. I looked into my heart. In that, his place, I saw him. He was in no other place. New Religious Developments in North India The period after the 13th century saw a new wave of the Bhakti movement in North India. This was an age when Islam, Brahminical Hinduism, Sufism, various strands of Bhakti and the Nath Pants, Siddhas and Yogis influenced one another. We saw that New Towns, Chapter 6, and kingdoms, chapters 2, 3, and 4, were emerging, and people were taking up new professions and finding new roles for themselves. Such people, especially craftspersons, peasants, traders, and laborers, thronged to listen to these new saints and spread their ideas. Some of them, like Kabir and Baba Guru Nanak, rejected all orthodox religions. Others, like Tulsidas and Surdas, accepted existing beliefs and practices but wanted to make these accessible to all. On the bottom right of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 7. This is the picture of Chaitanya Dev, a 16th century Bhakti saint from Bengal who preached selfless devotion to Krishna Radha. In the picture, you can see a group of his followers 
engaged in ecstatic dancing and singing. Tulsidas conceived of God in the form of Rama. Tulsidas's composition, the Ram Charit Manas, written in Avadhi, a language used in eastern Uttar Pradesh, is important, both as an expression of his devotion and as a literary work. Page 114 Surdas was an ardent devotee of Krishna. His compositions compiled in the Sur Sagar, Sursavali and Sahitya Lehri express his devotion. Also contemporary was Shankar Deva of Assam, late 15th century, who emphasized devotion to Vishnu and composed poems and plays in Assamese. He began the practice of setting up Namghars or Houses of Recitation and Prayer, a practice that continues to date. On the top of this page, a map of the subcontinent is shown. This is Map 1. It shows major Bhakti saints and the regions associated with them. Guru Nanak Dev, 15th to 16th century, Punjab. Dadu, 16th to 17th century, Rajasthan. Mirabai, 16th century, Rajasthan. Narsi Mehta, 15th century, Gujarat. Gyaneshwar, 13th century, Maharashtra. Eknath, 16th century, Maharashtra. Tukaram, 16th century, Maharashtra. Namdev, 13th to 14th century, Maharashtra. Basavanna, 12th century, Karnataka. Namma Lavar, 9th century, Tamil Nadu. Ramanuj, 11th to 12th century, Tamil Nadu. Manikkava Sagar, 9th century, Tamil Nadu. Purandar Das, 15th to 16th century, Andhra Pradesh. Ram Das, 17th century, Andhra Pradesh. Chaitanya Dev, 15th to 16th century, West Bengal. Shankar Dev, 15th to 16th century, Assam. Surdas, 16th century, Uttar Pradesh. Ramanand. Kabir, 15th to 16th century, Uttar Pradesh. Ray Das, 15th century, Uttar Pradesh. Vallabhacharya, 15th to 16th century, Uttar Pradesh. Tulsidas, 16th to 17th century, Uttar Pradesh. On the left-hand side of this page, an important information is given regarding Shankar Dev. The essence of Shankar Dev's devotion came to be known as Ek Sharan Nam Dharma or Supreme Surrender to the One. The teachings of Shankar Dev were based on the Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavad Puran. He also encouraged the establishment of Satra or monasteries for transmission of knowledge. His major compositions included Kirtan Ghosh. This tradition also included saints like Dadu Dayal, Ravidas and Mirabai. Mirabai was a Rajput princess married into the royal family of Mewad in the 16th century. Mirabai became a disciple of Ravidas, a saint from a caste considered untouchable. She was devoted to Krishna and composed innumerable bhajans expressing her intense devotion. Her songs also openly challenged the norms of the upper castes and became popular with the masses in Rajasthan and Gujarat. A unique feature of most of the saints is that their works were composed in regional languages and could be sung. 
they became immensely popular and were handed down orally from generation to generation. Usually, the poorest, most deprived communities and women transmitted these songs, often adding their own experiences. Thus, the songs as we have them today are as much a creation of the saints as of generations of people who sang them. They have become a part of our living popular culture. An important contribution of Bhakti saints was towards the development of music. Jayadev of Bengal composed the Geet Govind in Sanskrit. Each song composed in a particular rag and tal. A significant impact that these saints had on music was the use of bhajan, kirtan and abhang. These songs, which emphasized on emotional experience, had a tremendous appeal to the common people. A unique feature of most of the saints is that their works were composed in regional languages and could be sung. They became immensely popular and were handed down orally from generation to generation. Usually the poorest, most deprived communities and women transmitted these songs, often adding their own experiences. Thus, the songs as we have them today are as much a creation of the saints as of generations of people who sang them. They have become a part of our living popular culture. Beyond the Rana's Palace This is a song composed by Meera Bai. Rana Ji, I have left your norms of shame and false decorum of the princely life. I have left your town, and yet, Rana, why have you kept up enmity against me? Rana, you gave me a cup of poison. I drank it laughing. Rana, I will not be destroyed by you. And yet, Rana, why have you kept up enmity against me? Why do you think Mirabai left the Rana's palace? On the bottom left of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 8. This is the picture of Mirabai. Page number 116. A closer look, Kabir. Kabir, who probably lived in the 15th, 16th centuries, was one of the most influential saints. He was brought up in a family of Muslim Julahas or weavers settled in or near the city of Banaras or Varanasi. We have little reliable information about his life. We get to know of his ideas from a vast collection of verses called Sakhis and Pads, said to have been composed by him and sung by wandering bhajan singers. Some of these were later collected and preserved in the Guru Granth Sahib, Panchavani and Bijak. Page 116 A Closer Look, Kabir Kabir, who probably lived in the 15th-16th centuries, was one of the most influential saints. He was brought up in a family of Muslim Julahas or weavers settled in or near the city of Banaras or Varanasi. We have little reliable information about his life. We get to know of his ideas from a vast collection of verses called Sakhis and Pads, said to have been composed by him and sung by wandering bhajan singers. Some of these were later collected and preserved in the Guru Granth Sahib, Panchavani and Bijak, in search of the true Lord. Here is a composition of Kabir. O Allah, Ram, present in all living beings, have mercy on your servants, O Lord. Why bump your head on the ground? Why bathe your body in water? You kill and you call yourself humble, but your vices you conceal. 
Twenty-four times the Brahman keeps the Ekadashi fast, while the Kazi observes the Ramzan. Tell me, why does he set aside the eleven months? To seek spiritual fruit in the twelfth? Hari dwells in the east, they say, and Allah resides in the west. Search for him in your heart, in the heart of your heart. There he dwells, Rahim, Ram. In what ways are the ideas in this poem similar to or different from those of Basavanna and Jalaluddin Rumi? On this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 9. This is the picture of Kabir working on a loom. Page 100. 17. Kabir's teachings were based on a complete, indeed vehement, rejection of the major religious traditions. His teachings openly ridiculed all forms of external worship of both Brahminical Hinduism and Islam, the pre-eminence of the priestly classes and the caste system. The language of his poetry was a form of spoken Hindi, widely understood by ordinary people. He also sometimes used cryptic language, which is difficult to follow. Kabir believed in a formless, supreme God and preached that the only path to salvation was through bhakti or devotion. Kabir drew his followers from among both Hindus and Muslims. A Closer Look Baba Guru Nanak we know more about Baba Guru Nanak, 1469-1539, than about Kabir. Born at Talwandi, Nankana Sahib in Pakistan, he travelled widely before establishing a centre at Kartarpur, Dera Baba Nanak, on the river Ravi. A regular worship that consisted of the singing of his own hymns was established there for his followers. Irrespective of their former creed, caste or gender, his followers ate together in the common kitchen or langar. The sacred space thus created by Baba Guru Nanak was known as Dharmasal. It is now known as Gurdwara. On the right bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 10. This is the picture of Baba Guru Nanak as a young man in discussion with holy men. Before his death in 1539, Baba Guru Nanak appointed one of his followers as his successor. His name was Lehna, but he came to be known as Guru Angad, signifying that he was a part of Baba Guru Nanak himself. Guru Angad compiled the compositions of Baba Guru Nanak to which he added his own in a new script known as Gurmukhi. Page 118 The three successors of Guru Angad also wrote under the name of Nanak and all of their compositions were compiled by Guru Arjan in 1604. To this compilation were added the writings of other figures like Sheikh Farid, Sant Kabir, Bhagat Namdev and Guru Teg Bahadur. In 1706, this compilation was authenticated by Guru Teg Bahadur's son and successor, Guru Gobind Singh. It is now known as Guru Granth Sahib the Holy Scripture of the Six. On the left top of this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 11. This is an early manuscript of the Guru Granth Sahib. The number of Baba Guru Nanak's followers increased through the 16th century under his successors. They belonged to a number of castes, but 
traders, agriculturists, artisans and craftsmen predominated. This may have something to do with Baba Guru Nanak's insistence that his followers must be householders and should adopt productive and useful occupations. They were also expected to contribute to the general funds of the community of followers. By the beginning of the 17th century, the town of Ram Daspur or Amritsar had developed around the central Gurudwara called Harmandar Sahib or Golden Temple. It was virtually self-governing and modern historians refer to the early 17th century Sikh community as a state within the state. The Mughal emperor Jahangir looked upon them as a potential threat and he ordered the execution of Guru Arjan in 1606. The Sikh movement began to get politicized in the 17th century, a development which culminated in the institution of the Khalsa by Guru Gobind Singh in 1699. The community of the Sikhs called the Khalsa Panth became a political entity. The changing historical situation during the 16th and 17th centuries influenced the development of the Sikh movement. Page 119 The ideas of Baba Guru Nanak had a huge impact on this development from the very beginning. He emphasized the importance of the worship of one God. He insisted that caste, creed or gender was irrelevant for attaining liberation. His idea of liberation was not that of a state of inert bliss, but rather the pursuit of active life with a strong sense of social commitment. He himself used the term Nam, Dan and Isnan for the essence of his teaching, which actually meant right worship, welfare of others and purity of conduct. His teachings are now remembered as Nam Japna, Kirat Karna and Vand Chakna, which also underline the importance of right belief and worship, honest living and helping others. Thus, Baba Guru Nanak's idea of equality had social and political implications. This might partly explain the difference between the history of the followers of Baba Guru Nanak and the history of the followers of the other religious figures of the medieval centuries like Kabir, Ravidas and Dadu, whose ideas were very similar to those of Baba Guru Nanak. Martin Luther and the Reformation the 16th century was a time of religious ferment in Europe as well. One of the most important leaders of the changes that took place within Christianity was Martin Luther, 1483-1546. Luther felt that several practices in the Roman Catholic Church went against the teachings of the Bible. He encouraged the use of the language of ordinary people rather than Latin and translated the Bible into German. Luther was strongly opposed to the practice of indulgences or making donations to the church so as to gain forgiveness from sins. His writings were widely disseminated with the growing use of the printing press. Many Protestant Christian sects trace their origins to the teachings of Luther. On this page, a picture is shown. This is figure 12. This is the title page of the German Bible translated by Martin Luther. Page 120. Imagine, you are attending a meeting where a saint is discussing the caste system. Relate the conversation. Let's recall. 1. Match the following. The Buddha, Shankar Dev, Nizamuddin Aulia, Nainars, Alvars, Namghar, 
worship of Vishnu, questioned social differences, Sufi saint, worship of Shiva. 2. Fill in the blanks. A. Shankar was an advocate of fill in the blank. B. Ramanuj was influenced by the fill in the blank. C. Fill in the blank, fill in the blank and fill in the blank were advocates of Veer Shaivism. D. Fill in the blank was an important center of the Bhakti tradition in Maharashtra. 3. Describe the beliefs and practices of the Nath Panthis, Siddhas and Yogis. 4. What were the major ideas expressed by Kabir? How did he express these? Key words Veer Shaivism, Bhakti, Sufi, Khan Kaha. Page 121. Let's understand. 5. What were the major beliefs and practices of the Sufis? 6. Why do you think many teachers rejected prevalent religious beliefs and practices? 7. What were the major teachings of Baba Guru Nanak? Let's discuss. 8. For either the Veer Shavyas or the sons of Maharashtra, discuss their attitude towards caste. 9. Why do you think ordinary people preserved the memory of Mirabai. Let's do. 10. Find out whether in your neighborhood there are any dargahas, gurudwaras or temples associated with saints of the bhakti tradition in your neighborhood. Visit any one of these and describe what you see and hear. 11. For any of the saint poets whose compositions have been included in this chapter, Find out more about their works, noting down other poems. Find out whether these are sung, how are they sung, and what the poets wrote about. 12. There are several saint poets whose names have been mentioned but their works have not been included in the chapter. Find out more about the language in which they composed, whether their compositions were sung, and what their compositions were about. The chapter 8 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator, Babla Kuchar. You were just listening to this audio book. Technical control, Bati Langlingdo. Technical assistance, Vikas Sangwan. Assistance in production, Kusum Lata. Direction and production, Vimalesh Chaudhary. This audiobook is brought to you by CIET NCERT New Delhi India